Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon and good evening, if you're in different parts of the world from where I am currently. Um, I'd like to welcome every every one of you to this uh, public webinar, which has been organized by the International Institutes of Global Health at the United Nations University. My name is David McCoy. I have a background in medicine and public health, and I currently work as a research lead here at the International Institute of Global Health. And it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Phil Baker, who is a senior lecturer at Deakin University. And Phil will be talking about the policy, power and politics of infant and young child feeding. Uh, Phil is a, a, a wonderful colleague of mine. I've been working with Phil for about three years now, um, mainly working on a paper for a new Lancet series on breastfeeding where the two of us have been coordinating a paper on the political political economy of breastfeeding and infants and young child uh, feeding more generally. So Phil will be speaking for about 40 minutes and that will give us about 15 minutes of Q&A um, before we wrap up this webinar. So without any further delay, I'll hand over to you, Phil. Thanks very much uh, once again for coming to speak to us um, and over to you. Thank, thank you so much, Dave, and thank you also to the Institute uh, for having me today. It's an absolute pleasure to, uh, to join you from uh, Melbourne and Australia, and uh, also good to reflect, Dave, on, on some of the great work we've done over the last few years with, with some of our wonderful colleagues uh, on this topic, which we are uh, you know, quite passionate about uh, addressing. Uh, next, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, I'd just like to start by saying, uh, to, to reflect on what we mean by this term political economy, and the, which is essentially the approach we've been using uh, in our work over the last few years uh, to, to researching this topic. Um, we, unlike a lot of research, uh, we, we come to this with a strong starting normative position. And that is, um, and it's, you know, it's not often that we, excuse me, um, I'll just cut out there for a sec. It's not often that we come to research by explicitly stating our starting normative position. Uh, in this case, uh, we, we, we start out with our papers stating that we, um, the importance of breastfeeding and making a vital contribution to the realization of human rights, including the right to the highest attainable standard of health, the right to adequate food, and the right to life. Um, not only in terms of uh, children, but also for, for women and, and, and mothers uh, around the world. Now, a political economy approach uh, emphasizes how political, economic and social fa factors combine to structure infant and young child feeding um, practices and outcomes at the population level. So we're not, in this, in this work, we're not really talking about individual behaviors um, and in fact, quite the opposite. We're, we're, we're looking at the, at the population level. So we're concerned with what we call the basic causes of early life nutrition and uh, child and maternal health. So we're really interested in the bigger picture. Uh, what, what drives infant and young child feeding at the population level and indeed at the global level as well? We're, we're especially focused on, uh, this, on, on, on this role of power. So the distribution of power and resources between different actors and interests in society, uh, governments, civil society groups, corporations, health professionals, women and children, and uh, the processes that generate, sustain and transform these relationships over time. So the power to influence infant and young child feeding is what we're really concerned with. Um, and the allocation of resources in society uh, to that purpose. Uh, we also take a strong um, sort of position at the very start of our research by saying that we, we cannot just treat this issue of infant and young child feeding, of breastfeeding, uh, as purely a technical issue. We can't look at this through purely a compartmentalized problem-solving approach. This is not just a matter for the health sector, for example. There are many sectors, um, there are many aspects of society that influence on, that impact on infant and young child feeding. So we need to look at this collectively and we also need to consider not just this uh, not this issue not just as a technical issue but also this role of actors interests and power um, this is a social phenomena that we're studying 
Okay, and so uh, we, we, we take the position that we cannot address the scale and complexity of this challenge um, within the urgent timeframes we have without considering uh, this, uh, the, the role of power. Next slide, thank you. Um, okay, so, so what is the challenge we're facing here? Well, um, any, any talk on infant young child feeding really has to begin with, with this, um, the mother-child breastfeeding diet. Um, uh, we, we frame this as a powerful force for sustainable development in our recent papers. And um, this can be understood as a global on-demand food production system, um, one that delivers safe, optimal nutrition and immunological factors responsible to the child's evolving needs. And it's not something we often talk about, but breastfeeding is a crucial source of food. Um, it's, it's, it's a staple food source in all country contexts. Uh, average breast milk intake um, is about half a, half a kilogram a day uh, at around 12 to 23 months of age, uh, providing about 35 to 40% of the child's energy needs in, in low and middle income countries. So it's a remarkable food source. We don't often talk about it in this way. Um, but breastfeeding is also more than a food source. It is also a form of care and nurturing. Um, and it fosters this uh, you know, mother-child bonding, re releases um, oxytocin and other um, other factors that, that uh, are really important in sort of this, this nurturing care relationship between um, mother and child. Uh, now, because of the remarkable health benefits, developmental benefits and other, um, uh, other, other remarkable impacts of breastfeeding, w, uh, WHO recommends exclusive breastfeeding from birth to six months of age, then introducing complementary foods while breastfeeding continues for up to two years of age or beyond. So it's not just the first six months. Um, a lot of people sort of, um, think that this is just about the first six months of breastfeeding, but it's actually breastfeeding um, can continue for, for years um, beyond birth uh, as, this, as this really uh, crucial food source. Uh, despite this recommendation, uh, less than half of babies are currently meeting the WHO recommendations. Breastfeeding rates are improving, but less than half are still um, of, of children today uh, are realizing um, these benefits. So 49% uh, initiate breastfeeding in the first hour of life, 44% exclusively breast, breastfeeding to six months, and just 44% continuing breastfeeding at two years of age. Uh, next slide, please. So um, on, the, on the other hand, we, we see this, uh, what we've framed as this infant and young child feeding transition to more highly processed diets. And so um, uh, prior to the 1860s, um, uh, really breastfeeding was pretty much the only uh, option for children. Uh, those who didn't breastfeed had very high levels of, um, of mortality. Uh, commercial milk formulas or breast milk substitutes were invented in the mid 1860s, um, intended as a, a, a substitute or a replacement for breastfeeding. And since then, we have seen this remarkable growth or, and indeed displacement of breastfeeding by uh, commercial milk formulas. And this really um, took off in the, in the mid uh, 20th century. By 1978, about um, CMF sales were about one and a half um, billion dollars. This increased to about US $4 billion in 1983 um, to 22 billion in 2005. And, and, and our most recent estimates suggest that um, global formula sales were about 55 billion um, in 2019. So this represents um, the displacement of the breastfeeding diet with commercial supply chains across a widening scope of um, mothers, mother and child uh, populations. And in our papers, we describe this as a long historical process of commodification so displacing the biocultural social practice of breastfeeding uh, with um, a commodity, a form of um, artificial feeding uh, that is driven by a commercial system. This is what commodification really is all about. And we can think about this issue as a process uh, of continuing and historical uh, commodification. Now, this, uh, this, the figure that you see on the right is from the 2016 Lancet breastfeeding series. And this really drew attention to how remarkable the increase in global formula sales has been 
uh, in just the last uh, two decades, we've seen this increase, this what we've described as an unprecedented increase in the scale of uh, commercial milk formula markets, especially um, in the highly populated middle income countries of um, East and Southeast Asia, China in particular, uh, but also elsewhere, for example, in Latin America and countries like Brazil. Um, now, there is a long evidence, uh, long standing evidence base um, that shows uh, the impacts that this can have on um, infant, um, young child, and maternal health. Bottle baby, bottle baby food syndrome, a cycle of infection, dehydration, and malnutrition from artificial feeding in less than ideal conditions, primarily um, infections uh, meaning diarrhea and pneumonia, have been reported since the early 1900s. Uh, there are now well-established links between not breastfeeding with um, malocclusion, obesity, and type 2 diabetes uh, in later life. There are also significant environmental impacts of commercial milk formulas, including um, greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, water use, and packaging waste. And this is um, significantly more than, of, of course, breastfeeding, which is a highly sustainable practice. Uh, and the... Uh, oh, sorry, I haven't gone to my next slide, but... Um, the, the bigger picture here is that um, uh, that toddler, toddler milks in particular are, 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 are superfluous to human needs. So there is this um, rapid increase in the last decade, uh, two decades in sales of um, follow-up formulas and toddler milks. And uh, WHO recognizes these as um, superfluous to human need, unnecessary for healthy infant and young child diets. And um, therefore these use, are using scarce environmental resources and causing um, avoidable environmental harm. The bigger picture here, um, if you could just click uh, one more forward, please. Thank you. Uh, the bigger picture here is that um, uh, this rise in commercial milk formulas is part of a broader um, global rise in uh, ultra processed foods and what we call the nutrition transition. Uh, here's, on the right here, you can see this figure from our work showing uh, the rise of ultra-processed foods, uh, especially in the industrializing countries of East um, and Southeast Asia. Um, and so this is this displacement of uh, traditional diets of minimally processed and unprocessed foods uh, of traditional cuisines with industrial foods, ultra-processed foods. Um, and, and this is associated uh, with uh, significant changes in the food systems that provision these foods, and especially the industrialization of these food systems. Um, so so what, what the figure on the right here shows is that we see these huge differences between um, countries and regions, between country income levels, at, at similar levels of economic development. So why, why is um, growth in ultra-processed foods so high in some countries and regions um, excuse me, I haven't, uh, if you just go back to that previous slide, thank you. Um, why, why, why have we seen this remarkable growth in ultra processed food sales in some countries, uh, but not in others at the same level of economic development? Um, that's a really fascinating question that I, that I, we, we've tried to investigate in our, um, recent, uh, our recent studies. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we really see this with um, uh, commercial milk formulas as well. We can see these wide variations between countries at similar levels of economic development. Uh, this, the figure on the left-hand side shows um, differences between uh, growth rates in, in formula sales and uh, per, per infant child sales uh, levels in different countries around the world. Uh, for the standard infant formula category, which is for uh, zero to six months of age, for follow-up formula, which is six to 13 months, for toddler milks, which are 13 to 36 months, and for specialized formulas, which are for uh, medical conditions or otherwise called therapeutic milks. So you can see, um, it might be a little bit hard to see, sorry about that, but uh, these huge differences between countries. So um, growth is actually going down in some countries, but increasing in others um, at, at, and at, at similar uh, in income levels. Okay, and so that's a really interesting question. Why do we see such disparate, um, these huge, why do we see these huge differences between, um, uh, between countries? 
this, the figure on the right shows uh, that infant formula consumption um, under six months of age associates um, very strongly and negatively with continued breastfeeding at one year of age. So this kind of provides some evidence that there is, um, you know, a, a displacement effect uh, on breastfeeding. Next slide, please. Okay, so to explain this um, question of why we see these these huge differences between countries, um, we have a, we've adopted this concept of first food systems, and um, food, first food systems are the food systems that provision foods for infants and young children, and that structure feeding practices at the population level. So one of the things that we're trying to counter in our research is a narrative that feeding children is just about the responsibility of mothers, of women, of, of, of families. Okay, and this, this narrative that we hear sometimes that um, ultimately mothers and women are responsible for feeding children is, 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 can be quite harmful because um, what that does is it locates blame at the level of the individual. Uh, and it, that, that's not helpful at all. It doesn't help resolve the problem. Uh, it does not explain why we see these huge differences between countries. And so in our work, we, we, we say it's actually the structural explanation for why we see these differences. Okay, and first food systems um, are the systems that are structuring infant and young child feeding practices uh, at, at the population level. So the main components of first food systems that we describe in our paper um, uh, includes... Um, these six factors here, I won't describe them in detail. Uh, I'd said, shameless plug, refer you to the paper if you'd like to read it. Um, but the uh, factors five and six, the governance policy and regulatory frameworks, these are the, the policy and regulations that are put in place to promote and support um, um, breastfeeding, for example, uh, the regulation of commercial marketing practices, we see huge differences between countries in terms of the strength of these policies. Um, so that's a really important determinant or that's structuring first food systems and feeding practices across different countries is something we've been very interested in in our, in our work. And then this, um, the, the sixth factor here, actors, interests and power, the role of these different um, interest groups in shaping first food systems uh, is the other thing that we've paid a lot of attention to. And some of the questions that this framework help, helps answer, for example, is why did global breastfeeding rates plummet in the mid to late 20th century, more so in some countries than others? So, you know, this long-term historical process of, um, of, of declining and then rising breastfeeding rates, uh, what's driving the global rise in commercial baby foods and ultra-processed foods now underway, especially in East and Southeast Asia? And what explains the resurgence in breastfeeding we're now observing in some countries, for example, the United States, breastfeeding rates are going up, but that's not occurring in others. And so the systems approach um, can help uh, explain things here. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, moving on to um, one of the really important drivers of first food systems, uh, what we've called the, or what can be called the commercial determinants of infant and young child feeding. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so um, we, um, I, I didn't get to say this earlier, but I actually had a slide. Uh, I'm not sure what, what happened to it, but it was um, uh, where I, I, I just out gave an overview of the publications we um, have published in the last uh, uh, few years. And um, th this, this work that we've been doing has been supported by the World Health Organization, um, and has been supported by some remarkable colleagues uh, around the world. Um, uh, Dave, Dave who, who introduced the presentation, but also uh, Katie Russ, uh, Julie Smith, um, Paul Zambara, Roger Matheson, and, and many others that, I, that I, I, I won't name. But one of the thing, one of the starting points for our research into this topic was um, this question uh, concerning the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. Okay, so um, the, the, the code, you're probably all familiar with the code. It was adopted in 1981. Um, and since then, there have been over 20 World Health Assembly resolutions. I think it's now 22. I, I think it's, um, yeah, to, to update and strengthen the code. 
and and many people don't realize this, but the, the the code itself was one of just 30 such codes of guidelines adopted across or proposed across the United Nations at the time. And this was really a response to an attempt to regulate the growing power of um, transnational corporations. Um, so it was it was sort of seen as a landmark success back public health success back in 1981 because it was an attempt to rein in to to control the nefarious and aggressive marketing practices of um, the uh, the CMF or uh, baby food industry, which at the time was um, uh, being reported as causing significant harm through its marketing practices, and. Um, However, as of 2020, um, so nearly 40 years later after the code's adoption, just 70% of countries had adopted some provisions of the code international law. Um, 25 had laws substantially, substantially aligned with the code, so that's almost full implementation of the code, just 13%. And 58 or 30% had no provisions of the code adopted international law whatsoever. So this indicates that implementation, worldwide implementation of the code, the adoption of the code into national laws uh, and regulations uh, still has a really long way to go. Okay, so in, in a third of countries around the world, there are no regulations, um, you know, uh, on, on the marketing of breast milk substitutes. We're simply relying on what the, what the corporations themselves are doing. Um, so this is a really interesting question. Why is that the case? Why 40 years later do we have such a long way to go towards implementing the code? Next slide, please. Okay, so this led us to this, um, this research question of, uh, you know, to, to, uh, around the commercial determinants of infant and young child feeding. And our aim in this work was to understand um, how uh, the, the, the market and political practices of the baby food industry. So um, what we, we, we labeled as big formula, these are the companies uh, like big tobacco or big food, um, big formula, the companies that sell um, commercial milk formulas, but it's also the dairy industry that provides, you know, the main ingredients that go into formula uh, and also other um, uh, commercial interests like the advertising and branding sector. So the research questions we're asking in this work is who is big formula in the transnational baby food industry? How has this industry evolved and how is it now organized across markets and globally? What strategies and tactics has the industry used to shape first food systems and in doing so drive and sustain formula consumption on a global scale? And how can we understand this in terms of power and in doing so inform new modalities of, of public health action in particular to accelerate this you know, implementation of the code? Um, next slide, please. Okay, so to uh, we adopted a political economy framework, uh, and we drew from um, uh, conceptualizations of corporate power. Our starting point was to say the main source of corporate power is material. So, as these, um, you know, one thing that corporations have a lot of is a lot of access to resources, finance, cash, human resources that they can use to. Um, you know, promote their products, to invest in marketing, to invest, but also to invest in things like lobbying. So this was our starting point. What are the material assets and resources of the corporations? The forms of power, instrumental, structural, and discursive, refer to things like um, the lobbying or the, the instrumental power being um, direct actor to actor power. So lobbying, for example, structural power, meaning um, the power to indirectly influence the behavior of others through, for example, adopting self-regulation uh, and discursive power through shaping discourse, through influencing ideas, um, uh, through influencing science and research and evidence about infant and young child feeding. Okay, and we, we conceptualize these forms of power as being deployed or uh, as relating to other actors who shape uh, first food systems, including governments, civil society groups, um, scientists and experts and health professionals. We also conceptualize this um, very much in terms of contextual factors that amplify or constrain corporate power. So uh, for example, um, some countries, you know, some countries would um, have political um, systems 
where lobbying is much more effective, where corporations play much more of a role in the political and policy process. Okay, and so that enables corporate power, whereas other countries, um, that's that's much more diminished. So this was the framework in which we we started the research. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the first thing uh, we um, uh, we did was to look at how the corporations themselves have have globalized, and this is the long sort of story of how uh, commercial milk formula markets have spread around the world. All of the companies, almost all of the companies we looked at, are based in either Europe or the United States. There are a few companies in, say, China, uh, Korea, Japan which uh, are national companies, but it's really these transnational corporations that are based in um, uh, the US and, and the EU. And so the first thing we looked at was how have these, these companies globalized to spread commercial milk formula marketing around the world? And, and this data shows um, the global, uh, the, the country level production and exports of commercial milk formulas. So. In 2005, you can see that the USA was the, by far the world's largest producer of commercial milk formula. Uh, China was runner up and you can see a bunch of European countries there is producing significant amounts of formula as well. There was a little bit of trade going on, but not really that much. Then by 2017, you can see this remarkable change in the, um, uh, the levels of formula production where formula is being produced. So China is now by far um, the world's largest producer. You can also see this, this huge increase in trade in commercial milk formula. And this is what we describe as the hyper-globalization of um, commercial uh, baby food markets. Okay, so this really shows us something about um, how these transnational corporations uh, have spread. It also shows us something about um, how the dynamics of the markets and of infant and young child feeding um, has also changed uh, as well. And yeah, East and Southeast Asia is where we've seen this huge surge in commercial milk formula markets. Next slide, please. Um, this is not just a passive process where um, all of a sudden demand increases in different countries and um, the companies respond. It's it's as much, if not more so, about the formula industry itself spreading into new markets and um, establishing its marketing practices. Okay, and we describe this as the power of marketing. So as big formula has globalized, as markets have spread, so too has the industry's marketing practices. Okay, and now there's a pretty decent evidence base that shows that exposure to marketing of commercial milk formulas reduces initiation, duration, and exclusivity of breastfeeding, irrespective of country context. So all country context, um, this tends to happen. Now we can think about these marketing techniques, this power of marketing in three main ways. One is that uh, it's medical marketing that's direct engagement with health professionals. That is the funding of corporate research or corporate science. Um, that promotes uh, a medicalized interpretation of infant and young child feeding rather than a social, um, socially determined um, uh, understanding of infant and young child feeding. Uh, and the companies target marketing professionals um, because of how influential they are in influencing um, parental feeding decisions. So that's a really crucial um, uh, marketing strategy. The second is direct-to-consumer advertising. So we see this in, in magazines, on billboards. Um, whenever you go through an airport these days, you always, you know, in Australia, you always see these billboards for formula up on um, everywhere you go. But it's also increasingly through social media. And social media is now probably the dominant way in which companies directly reach consumers, new mothers. Uh, and Gerard Hastings' um, new paper, Selling Second Best, really demonstrates the power of this and how targeted those social media advertisements can be. The third strategy is um, a product strategies. And this is things like making claims on the products. So um, adding novel ingredients uh, like um, human milk oleosaccharides, like essential fatty acids uh, and so on and so forth. 
which are really about promoting this image of um, formula as comparable or even superior to uh, to breast milk, um, and, and in itself as a as a powerful marketing technique. There's also this the strategy of cross promotion, whereby um, uh, up until the mid 1980s, it was really infant formula for zero to 12 months, a single product category that was marketed marketed by the companies around the world. Then, when the international code of marketing was introduced in the 80s, as governments around the world started to regulate formula markets and, and marketing, the company invented uh, or, or started to much more heavily advertise and market toddler milks and follow-up formulas. And this was a way to really circumvent regulations that restricted marketing of products for zero to six months. So products for zero to six months were being regulated. So the company started much more heavily advertising products for older infants and young children. And it uses similar, similar packaging and labeling are used on these products uh, to, to the infant formula. And this cross promotes the infant formula. So it's really a way of getting around um, the regulations. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is, I think, um, uh, the, the, the marketing strategies and techniques have long been described in the literature. What our, uh, our, our work has, has um, helped to do is to really illustrate the, um, the political influence of the industry. So as the industry has globalized, um, so has the baby food industry's global influence network or, or, or lobbying network, I should say. So as, as, the, as, the, as the industry globalizes, as markets become increasingly important, the industry has established lobby groups in in those markets to protect, uh, to, uh, to create favorable policy and regulation, to counteract regulation that threatens uh, the market. Okay, so this um, figure shows uh, the white circles represent the corporations, uh, the lines represent membership, and the dots are the um, the lobby groups, the lobbying associations, and the size of the circles are proportionate to the number of um, uh, uh, ties uh, with these lobby groups. So Nestle, for example, is uh, the most globalized uh, corporation. It has links to more um, lobby groups around the world than any other uh, of the corporations. Okay, so, um, and what we see is that there are these, the red circles represent um, lobby groups that are there or established to counteract regulation on infant and young child nutrition in particular, to counteract regulation of commercial milk formula marketing practices. Um, so that's really the core of the network uh, are the red dots and, and, and lines. But around them are these other uh, lobby groups branding and advertising associations, food, beverage, and grocery manufacturer associations, and dairy industry trade associations, and, and um, consumer information and industry-funded scientific organizations, which are there to disseminate corporate-funded research to influence science and evidence um, around, these, uh, around these issues. So this is a really um, interesting um, commercial ecosystem uh, that is established to do one thing, that is to have political influence uh, on a global level. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one of the things we see that these lobby groups are doing and, and indeed what the corporations are doing is to promote um, the, uh, the corporate policies of, of the companies, uh, it's, uh, of, the comp of the companies themselves. So the, the International Code of Marketing calls for industry compliance with the code and the, um, the, uh, in response to pressure from civil society groups and governments, the industry has adopted their own corporate policies or voluntary forms of self-regulation um, to restrict their marketing activities. And uh, you can go to their websites, look at these policies, um, that these corporate policies. Nestle was the first to introduce one way back in 1982. Um, and, uh, when you actually look at or analyze these uh, corporate policies, you see they fall far short of compliance with the international code. Some of the assessments have been, that have been done um, indicate that 
um, they yeah are not even meeting um, half the provisions of, of the code. Now, um, in uh, the commercial determinants of health literature, this strategy is called policy substitution. It's a, it's a technique that's used by corporations to try and um, preempt, delay, or deter regulation by the state. So as to say, hey, look, we're responsible. We are voluntarily restricting our marketing practices. You do not need to regulate us. Um, and it fosters this image of corporate responsibility to internal stakeholders like employees. So employees at Nestle, for example, um, are, are assured that the, co the corporation is being responsible even when it's not. Uh, but also to external stakeholders like shareholders, um, to government regulators, uh, and to and to consumers as well. Um, yeah. So uh, this is a this the strategy of, of policy substitution um, is 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 a, is another key um, uh, strategy used by the industry to deter uh, regulation. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, another thing we looked at very closely in our work is how um, the industry has contested baby food standards at the international level. So, um, and this is what we describe as a regime, a regime complex for infant and young child nutrition. This regime complex uh, comprises two regimes. On the left side of this figure, you can see the global public health regime. The centers on the Convention on the Rights of the Child the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and the Food and Agricultural Organization. And these uh, UNICEF and WHO establish global um, standards and norms on the marketing of breast milk substitutes, for example, the International Code, but also the Global Strategy for Infant and Young Child Feeding. And there are a range of other um, policies, recommendations, technical guidance documents that governments all around the world look to UNICEF, look to WHO uh, to guide their own national policies and regulations. So this is really important work that WHO and UNICEF do. Now, WHO and FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, jointly administer something called the Codex Alimentarius Commission. This is the UN food regulatory body. It establishes food standards, international food standards, for two objectives. The first is to protect um, public health, so to put in place um, standards, uh, minimum standards um, uh, to protect consumers. Okay, and, and um, the second is to harmonize international food standards, which helps to facilitate trade between countries. Um, uh, and this includes standards on um, infant formula and on follow-up formula. Okay, so baby food standards are covered by uh, Codex. Um, now, uh, Codex has become really important and it's important for some several reasons. One is that national food regulators adopt codex standards, often adopt codex standards or look to codex uh, to inform their own national regulations. Um, the second is that codex standards are referenced by various WTO agreements. Uh, the Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement, for example, um, established in 1990, 1995. Um, and this has made codex standards really important because if countries, um, go to implement standards that are stronger than codex, uh, they might be um, they might be um, asked to justify those standards in the World Trade Organization. So on the right, you can see this international trade regime uh, comprising WTO and preferential trade and investment agreements, um, which uh, where baby food standards being implemented by national governments are often scrutinized. And I'll say a little bit more about um, that in, in one second. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so when we go to the, the Codex Elementarius Commission, we can see that um, that the, the baby food industry is strongly represented in, in the setting of international baby food standards. Okay, so we, can, um, we see this in two particular ways. One is that the ba baby food industry is going to Codex as part of member state delegations. So governments going to Codex as member states who are meant to have, um, you know, the, uh, the most say over Codex standards are actually often um, have a strong industry representation. In some cases, we found that the member state delegation was only industry. 
So basically industry is going to codex a lot of the time and um, being represented as member states. And so quite a lot of influence therefore over codex standard setting processes. Um, we can also see that uh, the observers that go to codex, so these are non-state observers um, comprising civil society organizations, um, NGOs representing public health, but um, also industry observers uh, strongly, um, much more heavily weighted towards industry. So in 2019, 95 industry delegates versus 16 delegates from non-governmental organizations. So a lot of influence over codex standards. And we can see these contestations playing out over the standards. Um, for example, concerning how to reference the international code in the standards, the allowable ingredients that can be used, um, whether follow-up formulas are designated breast milk substitutes or not, um, the additives of sweet taste and sweeteners and sugar content, and this issue of cross-promotion, which I mentioned before, have been all strongly contested by um, industry, industry groups. Next slide, please. Now, when we go to, when we look at the World Trade Organization, um, um, there, there hasn't actually been any trade arbitration by a member state to another member state concerning the implementation of national regulations uh, on commercial milk formulas. There has been for um, issues like tobacco and alcohol and um, other, other public health issues, but we haven't seen any arbitration relating to commercial milk formulas in particular. However, this really important work by Katie Russ found that when you actually go to look at sub-arbitration processes, so this is um, uh, raising um, uh, or making interventions in the World Trade Organization fora, like the technical barriers to make to trade committee or, the, or during the WTO accession process or, gen, or, or during periodic what are called trade policy reviews. So this is all, you know, the back, these are all the backroom sort of processes of the WTO. We can see lots and lots of interventions by the USA, the European Union, Australia, New Zealand uh, in particular against other countries implementing national um, CMF marketing regulations. And in fact, Katie's work found 245 interventions made between 1996 and 2019 against member states trying to implement or regulate um, their CMF markets. So the WTO is essentially being used as a way to counteract um, the implementation of the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. It's a really important, I think, barrier to accelerating progress uh, on this issue. Uh, next slide, please. Now, when we see um, what this actually looks like at the country level, we um, Katie's work and uh, really shows how this has played out for uh, Thailand in particular. There are some other case studies that we've looked at, but you can see um, how these interventions have played out in the WTO, all the arguments that have been made. And in the case of Thailand, this resulted in a much weaker uh, national, um, national marketing regulations. So very real, tangible and detrimental impact that is harmful to child and maternal health. Uh, and I'll refer you to the paper uh, if you'd like to read more about it. Next slide, please. Um, we've also looked very closely at how this has played out at the national level. And at the national level, we can see the establishment of these, um, these front groups or these lobby groups. And these lobby groups um, have adopted quite similar strategies and tactics to oppose uh, the adoption of national regulations. So, um, so first of all, that includes establishing the lobby groups themselves. Nestle, Abbott, Danone, uh, the big companies, depending on who's, who's, who's dominates in the market, will establish, establish these lobby groups. Um, those lobby groups will make arguments like, we support jobs, investment, economic growth and development, we're good for your economy, um, you should, you know, therefore not regulate us. Um, they also mobilize other business um, lobby groups uh, to counter regulation. Um, and uh, in the case of the Philippines, initiated legal action in the Supreme Court of the Philippines to oppose, um, to, to oppose uh, uh, a new national regulation. 
Uh, more recently, we have seen the industry groups um, attempt to forge partnerships with government and civil society. So this is going from a strategy of conflicting with civil society groups and government agencies to appeasements to try and um, to win people over. Uh, so, you know, it's a very detailed paper and I'd refer you to it if you're interested in reading what, what we think, what we sort of say is a forensic investigation of um, the strategies and tactics used by um, uh, the industry in the Philippines. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that we have also done um, is to look at, uh, evaluated the claims made by the industry about um, its, its social and economic value. So this is a, a, a quote from the Philippines where the lobby group said, um, called on the uh, Committee of Industry and Trade to, um, to, to oppose the implementation of new regulations. And so they're saying, you know, we, um, this, these regulations will impact on trade, employment, and investment. And we don't think you should adopt these regulations. We subjected these claims to um, scrutiny in our recent work led by um, a brilliant researcher, Benjamin Wood. Uh, and what we find was, you know, quite interesting. Um, now, despite these claims about the benefits produced by the industry, um, it's also generating significant costs in terms of the healthcare burden, um, reduced workforce, product, workforce productivity and ecological harms associated with um, not breastfeeding and, and, the, and the commercial milk formulas themselves, but also because purchasing commercial milk formula diverts expenditure away from sustainable forms of, food, of expenditure on things like food, healthcare, and education. And, then, and in, in many countries, we see the cost of purchasing commercial milk formula can be somewhere between 15 to 75% of a worker's average monthly salary. So this is a huge diversion of, of expenditure, and especially among lower socioeconomic groups where CMF mark, um, consumption is becoming increasingly prevalent. We also see the industry has um, reduced in, uh, income tax payments to governments over the last several decades, while at the same time, um, uh, increase the distribution of its income to shareholders. Uh, so and those shareholders are uh, uh, located mostly in high income countries. So we sort of say, you know, this is a form of wealth extraction, selling formula to people in low and middle income countries and extracting that wealth to um, shareholders in high income countries, while at the same time reducing the tax payments that governments need. Governments need that tax revenue to do things like, you know, promote uh, provide breastfeeding support services. So this is a, a what we call a double burden of maldistribution. And um, I'll refer you here to Ben's um, excellent work uh, on this topic. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll wrap it up because I know I've gone over time and I apologize for that. Um, but in conclusion, um, the CMF industry has used um, a number of techniques to market their products, to globalize and spread commercial milk formula around the world. But this marketing is only possible because of, because of the large investments the industry makes in fostering favorable policy reg regulatory and knowledge environments that enable and sustain such marketing. So this is what we refer to as the industry's political activities. And these political activities represent a major impediment to worldwide implementation of the code and global progress on breastfeeding. And we need to, need to discuss how we respond to these political activities, how we, um, how we reduce the political influence of the CMF industry, because arguably it's gonna be very hard to make any progress, further progress on breastfeeding unless we uh, reduce that influence. Um, and I just wanted to also say this presentation has not addressed major structure, other major, major structural determinant, determinants of infant and young child feeding, for example, um, uh, the importance of, of uh, maternity protection and the medicalization of, of, of healthcare systems. These are things that we also discuss very much in a forthcoming paper that Dave mentioned earlier, the uh, upcoming Lancet series, and be, I'd be happy to, dis would, uh, very happy to discuss those as well. Uh, but thank you, I'll finish there. Yeah. <laughs>
Phil, can you hear me? I, I can. Oh, good. Um, I just want to say thank you for that excellent, wonderful presentation describing uh, corporate political and marketing activities and its uh, role in shaping infant and young child feeding practices. Um, I'm hoping that Vithya and Anne are going to help me with moderating the questions because I know we've had a couple of questions that have been posted in the chat, but I can't see them. Um, so one of the questions we've got, Phil, is, is about the accountability mechanisms um, related to the code. What, what mechanisms exist within, for example, the UN system to hold countries accountable for adoption and implementation of the code, um, particularly for those member states that have um, that you know have have agreed to support the code in in the World Health Assembly. Oh, thanks. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the one of the reasons why international you know international forms of law are effective or ineffective is because of the strength of the accountability um, mechanisms that are established around them. The International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes was established um, as a code, um, so a set of recommendations for member states to implement. It's not a it's not a treaty. It's not a, like a framework convention on tobacco control. It's a non-binding set of recommendations. So that in itself is a pretty weak form of accountability. And that's one thing that I think we need to start discussing is how do we actually move towards a stronger international a, a, a form of international law to protect um, infant and young child nutrition, child and maternal health, um, because we just know that not not enough countries are implementing uh, the code. The second form of accountability is the strength of civil society representation into international policy making fora, like the World Health Assembly, like Codex, uh, the transparency in, in WTO processes and so on. Um, and you know, we, we know there's been huge um, conflicts over things like FENSA, the framework um, of engagement for non-state actors at the WHO and the World Health Assembly. Um, but, you know, that's another thing where groups like IBFAN, um, other civil society groups have been, like Helen Keller International, have been extremely important in holding member states accountable, holding industry accountable in those international fora. But we don't resource them at all very well. They are under-resourced um, given the impact and importance that they have. So that, that's another suggestion, you know, how do we resource these, this, the civil society groups to have much more accountability in that international system. Um, the third thing is that the, the Committee on the Rights of the Child reports on governments um, implementing the national code, implementing other policies that protect the rights of, of, of the child. That includes implementation of the International Code of Marketing. Now, that's a pretty weak form of accountability. You know, it's a, it's a naming and shaming. It's to say, hey, look, um, you haven't government, you know, uh, Australia, you haven't implemented um, these policies, come on, you can do much more to protect the rights of the child by implementing the code international law. Now, we know that there are significant gaps in this accountability mechanism because we've just, you know, Katie's work has reported uh, 245 cases or instances in the WTO where member states have opposed other member states implementing national regulations and that's not reported by the Committee on the Rights of the Child. It's not reported anywhere until Katie's paper, um, you know, came out. So there are these huge gaps in accountability in the system that we also need to talk about and address. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thanks, Phil. And I suppose the other the other issue about, you know, holding the health community accountable for infant and young child feeding outcomes and practices is the role played by health professionals in, in actually promoting commercial milk, uh, milk formula. So um, what, what can you say about that, Phil? Is um, Because I think within the health community, we've got um, groups and actors that are trying to promote and protect breastfeeding, but there are also groups and actors that may either be consciously or inadvertently promoting milk formula in inappropriate ways. Um, what can you say about regulation within the health system or within the health professional community? 
Yeah, well, I mean, this is, I think, a really, really important part of the conversation that we need to talk about a lot more. And that is um, the commercial, the formula industry targets health professionals in, in lots of different ways. And we see that so evidently with this overprescription of specialized formulas in lots of countries around the world. So in the UK, 10 times more prescriptions for specialized formulas than we would otherwise expect given the actual prevalence of the conditions. Um, this is being driven by industry groups. They sponsor um, pediatric and dietetics and allergist associations. So this is a direct financial relationship with professional organizations. They're also advertising in um, medical journals. We just published a commentary in BMJ Global Health talking about Nature um, Journal, a Nature Journal um, publishing advertisements by Abbott, um, for example. Uh, so there are, and, and, the, and the corporations themselves actually fund a lot of um, research on infant and young child feeding. So there's lots of these avenues of influence. That's not to mention sponsorship scholarships um, or these extensive online digital learning platforms that the companies have, you know, nest to health professionals. At the same time, no, we see hardly any actual um, training going on in medical schools and lots of other uh, health professional um, training providers are, you know, often ignoring breastfeeding and infant and young child feeding. So there's this huge gap in, um, in, in, in how we're training our health professionals um, on these issues. We also see a really weak implementation of the um, Baby Friendly Hospitals Initiative. I think it's only 10% of babies are, are worldwide are born in a baby friendly hospital. Okay, and this is really, um, you know, baby friendly hospitals, are, 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 are hospitals that have taken steps to remove um, commercial marketing influences from the hospital setting itself. Um, so 90% of babies are being born in hospitals where that's not, you know, happening. Um, again, that's another um, huge issue. And, and I'll just say, sorry, I'm blabbing on, but th the other thing is professional organizations um, and, and scientific journals um, really need to start adopting um, their own policies around, you know, whether or not they, um, how they're managing conflicts of interest um, you know, whether or not they should be accepting any industry funding at all, because these these conflicts of interest um, are causing harm. And that's not what health professionals are there to do. Um, so, yeah, I'll stop yeah. there. Great. Thanks, Phil. So there's a lot to be done within the health sector itself. Um, just another question that's been posted relates to the issue of, of gender and women's empowerment in society. Is there much evidence um, showing a correlation between um, indices of gender equality and breastfeeding practices or infant and young child feeding practices? Do we have much evidence showing that these factors are correlated at all? Yeah, so the topic of gender, I mean, and I do apologize because that's something um, we can't really talk about infant and young child feeding without talking about gender because it, it is, you know, the, the large majority of infant and young child feeding, like all forms of care work, and we call it care work, um, breastfeeding is a form of care work, for example, um, are, are done by women. And, and yet, you know, we, we, most societies have gendered powered systems, gendered power systems that disadvantage women that don't provide them with the support for breastfeeding. That includes a lack of support for maternity protection. And we know that the large majority of women in the world are not and new mothers are not provided with maternity protection that provides them the financial support um, to leave the workforce or even just support, financial support to, um, to, to adequate, you know, to breastfeed. Um, especially in that first six months. So that's that's the first thing. The second thing is that, um, you know, CM, the CMF industry, CMF sales contribute to GDP, um, are recognised in national accounting systems, um, but breast, breastfeeding is not. This, this really remarkable and important form of, you know, of, of productive activity, of, of care work that women do is invisible 
um, because it's not seen as, as, as counting in things like GDP or national accounting systems. And I really refer to Julie Smith's work here and to others who have pioneered work in this area. But you know, that's this, 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 this um, um, invisibility of women's work and especially care work is really a, a form of applied patriarchy. And it's, um, you know, a, a something that is just so remarkably important um, that we need to talk more about. Uh, the, the, the third thing I'll just say is that um, health systems are also very gendered. Um, so, you know, this, the, the woman-centered care prov provided, you know, largely by um, midwives, for example, has been increasingly replaced by, um, you know, obstetric care, pediatric care in many countries. And this has led to, you know, elevated levels of obstetric violence, uh, very high levels of C C birth sub by cesarean section, which are harmful to breastfeeding. Um, so, so there's also there's these healthcare systems and the models of care uh, very much need to be a part of the conversation as well. And it's just, there's so much more to say about gender, but um, yeah, I'll leave yeah. it there. Yeah, no, thanks, Phil. Um, we, we've come to the end of our one hour. Um, so there were a few more questions in the chat box, which perhaps we can try and respond to by by email or, or in, in writing at some later stage. But for now, um, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. And with that, I just really want to say thank you so much, Phil, for taking the time out to come and speak to us. Um, I'm sure that everyone who's attended uh, has found it incredibly interesting. And um, we'll, we'll certainly be able to share, hopefully, your slides with everyone who's attended so that they can follow up on some of the papers that you referenced in your talk. But, thanks so uh, much. Just finally, yeah, thanks again. And uh, to everyone on, in the audience, I hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you soon again at the next uh, public webinar that the Institute will be organizing. Thanks again and all the best. Thanks so much, Dave. And thanks for having me. Our yeah. pleasure. Bye.